Thank you for joining us for a conversation on the settlement of Navahine v. Department of Transportation and how we can all work together to ensure that every young person in Hawaii knows about this case and knows about their right to a safe and livable climate. I'm Debbie Milliken. I work at Punahou School in Sustainability. And I really think it's important for educators as we come together to have these conversations. So I appreciate all of you taking your time to be here today. I'd like to introduce um, Krista Heiser, who will introduce herself, and then Matt, our co-facilitators. Aloha, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Krista, and I am a climate educator really passionate about all of these issues and how we can uh, represent and teach them in all academic disciplines. And I really want to thank Debbie for keeping me engaged with this case because I, I feel like a lot of people have missed it. Uh, you know, we were kind of following the case and then just really how important this settlement is. So I really want to thank all of you for uh, making this effort to engage us in uh, really understanding what this means for Hawaii's youth and for climate action in Hawaii. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Dos Santos, and I am the co-executive director of our Children's Trust. Um, we are one of the nonprofit advocacy organizations that brought this lawsuit um, I'm located in Portland, Oregon. Our partners, however, um, are Earth Justice, and um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, know them. They're uh, located in Hawaii. Great. Thank you, Krista and Matt. And Matt, for your, your team from our Children's Trust, you're on the call as well, supporting us. I'm really excited that we're able to be here today to bring everyone up to speed on this historic settlement agreement and what that means um, for Hawaii and for Hawaii's young people. So here's how we'll spend our time together today. Matt is going to share a quick introduction of our Children's Trust and who they are. And then he'll share some background on the case, why they came to Hawaii, why transportation, and then he'll talk about the settlement agreement, how we got here or how we got there and how we go from here, because that's the great stuff that's coming. Um, and then we're also excited to talk to those of you tonight who are willing to join us and helping us to ensure that every young person in Hawaii knows that the state of Hawaii has agreed that youth have the right to a clean and healthful environment. So that's kind of wordy, I'll just make it really clear. We all have a right to a life-sustaining climate um, and a future. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt, um, who will share more about the case. And towards the end, we'll talk a bit about what we're doing next in terms of um, building curriculum. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Debbie and, and Krista. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's really awesome to be here with a community of educators. I know Debbie has heard me say this a bunch of times, but one of my my dreams of, of our work is really to take what I think is some of the really excellent legal work that we've done um, in partnership with Earth Justice and turn it into a curriculum that can be advanced here in Hawaii and also in the mainland, right? Where we can teach young people about how to engage with their government and how to demand uh, that their rights be protected, uh, including the right to a livable climate and a safe future. So I'm super excited to be here and, and really excited to dig in with, with you all on this. So let me just give you a quick introduction to Our Children's Trust, and then we'll jump into Navahine. So Our Children's Trust is an organization that's based out of uh, Eugene, Oregon, though we have staff members all over the country. Um, and until really recently, actually, we had a staff member in Honolulu. Um, and, and we even have attorneys now who in Amsterdam and in Belgium. We um, have some basic principles to all of our engagements, so all of our cases. And those are that all of our cases are based in the best available science. We only litigate cases on behalf of young people uh, on, and who are suing their governments for their actions in perpetuating the climate um, crisis. And 
we um, deeply believe that government plays a vital role in protecting the citizenry. So um, what does that sort of mean in, um, in, in sort of practical matters? Um, so when we engage uh, at a case level, we're engaging cutting edge legal strategists. We're also working with award-winning scientists um, we're, and we're powering young people who are asserting their constitutional rights to a safe and livable climate by sharing their stories. We're really about building platforms for young people to engage and share their stories and make change, um, teaching children that they have power and that their voice is their power. We want, and to that end, we want every child to a young person adult, lawyer, judge, policymaker, elected leader, you know, the list goes on and on, to understand that children and young people have constitutional rights to a safe and livable climate. And we have those rights right now, right? We, we our constitutions um, uh, don't make sense without them. And what do I mean by that? So we know that all of our founding documents here in the U.S. and really around the world, because many of them have these same basic principles. Yeah, I'm on a Punahou thing. Were written to guarantee rights essential to a healthy democracy. But when they were written, many of them were written before the climate crisis existed, before it had elevated into, um, you know, the, the uh, popular consciousness. And it, it certainly didn't exist as the greatest threat to those rights as we understand it today. So we're asserting these rights in court because it's the third branch of our government's job to protect our rights. Um, you know, we think of uh, about courts and how they were created as checks on power uh, on the other branches of government and to protect the rights of uh, minority opinions or people who are oppressed. And, hmm, I, I sort of laugh when I think about this, but in 2024, and maybe I shouldn't laugh because it's not that funny. I, I think our political future in the United States is, is somewhat uncertain. And, um, and that's why we really uh, believe that, you know, courts have a fundamental role to play here. So we're centering children's constitutional rights because we want to create enduring solutions that can't be unwound as soon as an administration or an agency um, changes over, right? A new agency head takes over. And our cases, you know, while they may seem unique in the context of today's political climate, they're really inspired by social movements that have come before us. They're inspired by suffrage, desegregation, reproductive rights, marriage equality, and the children who were at the core and the heart and soul of each of those social movements for justice. Like any of those movements that I just mentioned, this path takes time to build, but we believe that it is our best shot at creating an environment for solutions to the biggest threat that are facing children today, the climate crisis. So, that's a little bit of a background on our children's trust. And I wanna you know, quickly dig into um, this case and then provide you an opportunity to hear directly from some of the plaintiffs in this case. So as I said at the outset, this case was really developed in partnership with Earth Justice based in Hawaii. Um, here's a, I love this picture. This is a picture of our teams with some of the plaintiffs as we were about to go into um, the, the governor's office to do the press conference with the governor announcing the settlements. And, and it's just like, just seeing the, the image kind of gives me chills and goosebumps because it, it's such a, it was such an amazing day. Okay, so why, why Hawaii? Um, the, the case really started 13 years ago when our Children's Trust started supporting young people who were first filing a petition for rulemaking in, on Mother's Day in, on, in 2011. So Mother's Day in 2011. Um, 
And then with this lawsuit, which uh, Navahine versus Hawaii Department of Transportation, which was filed on June 1st, 2022 against the state of Hawaii and Hawaii Department of Transportation. Uh, needless to say, our, our petition for rulemaking back 13 years ago was not successful. Um, we attempted at that point to engage the government to um, to to acknowledge and protect children's rights and their their fundamental right to a life sustaining climate, and um, didn't get the results that we wanted. So we started working up this litigation. Um, we developed the case over. Uh, you know, many years, so you can see the gap of 13 years in partnership with local community um, and litigated the case with Earth Justice's Mid-Pacific Office, which is the office located in Honolulu, Hawaii. They um, they were our co-counsel um, and it was, you know, incredible to have Earth Justice's expertise on this case. So the, the Hawaii Constitution has some really uh, special provisions. Uh, and we asserted um, a couple of them in this litigation. The, the youth plaintiffs, um, in their, one of their claims was that H. Um, Dot's operation of transportation, of a transportation system that resulted in high levels of greenhouse gas emissions, violated their state constitutional rights, causing them significant harm and impacting their ability to live healthful lives in Hawaii now and into the future. Um, and, and that was really uh, the central you know, thrust of our case. The, the other piece that was really important and that was uh, important to Hawaii was that, that the plaintiffs you know, asserted through their case that HDOT's operation of a transportation system resulting in high levels of greenhouse gas. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm getting confused. The, um, that that the, the youth sought to ensure that Governor and HDOT's success in meeting the state legislature's goals to decarbonize Hawaii's economy and achieve zero emissions in transportation by 2045. So um, let me just back up since I kind of confused my slides a little bit that there was the constitutional claim that I started out talking about, but then there were also laws, really good laws that had been passed by Hawaii that um, sought to create a zero emissions transportation system. And when we looked at what was happening in Hawaii, we could see that that agency was an outlier and was preventing Hawaii from meeting its emission standards. And at the time, um, the emissions created by HDOT were over half of emissions of, of all of the state emissions. So we, we knew that this was a really critical pathway um, to Hawaii decarbonizing um, and, and you know, Hawaii having a successful transition to clean and renewable energy. So I, I sort of started getting into this a little bit, but, but why transportation? And you can see here on this, this slide that, um, that the transportation sector was a place where we could create an outsized impact for climate and young people's abilities to live safe, healthy lives. And that was because the transportation sector, as I sort of just mentioned, um, accounted for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions in Hawaii. And, and those emissions were projected to remain high through 2045 with the existing policies in place. So without change, the transportation sector would have been the culprit behind a full 60% of the state's emissions by just 2030. So just around the corner. Um, you can also see that the, the, the budget for Hawaii transportation sector um, was an enormous part of the state's budget. It was the, the greatest part by far. And, um, and that, that really also emphasized for us that it was important to look at how transportation dollars were being invested. I, and this was really one of the most, if not the most critical aspects um, for the state's ability to address um, climate change. So I, um, I'm going to uh, stop now and let Laura take over because we want to show you a couple of videos that um, that uh, just came out actually on PBS Hawaii 
of our plaintiffs talking about the case and the importance of the case. Unfortunately, we weren't able to have them join us here today, but we will have some plaintiffs joining in person um, on uh, September 9th when we gather in person. So Laura, I'll let you take it away with the video. So we're here today at a beautiful Kayona, really a gathering place for the Waimanalo community, the community that I come from. Waimanalo is located on the windward side of Oahu. Uh, it's a coastal community. Every time you come here, you can always depend on seeing a loved one or an Ohana member that you know. And um, yeah, just a beautiful place and a place that I was really raised. I'm also a part of uh, the, the restoration project of the fish pond behind me, um, which is my namesake, Pahonu. We're trying to restore um, not only the actual place, but the stories and the different resources that used to be in existence around that area. I've seen drastic changes when it comes to our environment and our climate here in Waimanalo. And this beach being one of them, the beach that is right behind me uh, was once, you know, had a longer sand and there was much more of a beach than it's, it's scary. But um, I think things like the lawsuit really give give support to me and my fellow plaintiffs and continuing really the, the work that we're doing in our communities to combat climate change. Navahine versus Hawaii Department. On behalf of young people. We started sharing about our own experience in our communities and what we're actively doing. And then the opportunity came up to, you know, to actually be a part of it. I, I agreed to it because it did align to, to my beliefs and I felt it was needed. When we speak about land, we also speak about ocean. And when we speak about the ocean, we also are speaking about the land. They really do require equal amount of attention and protection when it comes to really addressing and balancing um, balancing our natural environment and um, finding out where our responsibility to the land and the ocean is. An uh, important philosophy in, in the Hawaiian culture is aloha aina and aloha kai, and that is to take care of and love the land and love the ocean. I realize now that we've settled that this case is monumental across the world. There are people internationally having conversations about what this case in Hawaii by 13 different youth plaintiffs is doing to the world. Okay, I think that this is our cue, Debbie, to pause for some questions just momentarily, and then we'll jump in with a few more details about the case. Yeah, definitely. And if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute. I don't see anything in the chat right now, but if you prefer to write your question in the chat, you can do that. And um, there will be another chance to ask questions at the end as well. We did just get a question from Tiffany. Sure. She's asking, how were youth identified as plaintiffs? Was there a public call for participants? Yeah, so I mean, it was really, it's a little bit of an art, right? I, I wish there was like a single answer. We get asked this question a lot. Our um, plaintiffs come to us from a bunch of different places. In this particular case, I would say that most of the plaintiffs came to the case through relationships that existed between partner organizations and Earth Justice. Um, so several of the, um, the folks at Earth Justice who have worked on these issues and who are deeply related um, to uh, the various youth in um, across the various islands of, of Hawaii, uh, you know, sort of put out a call 
that and said that they were um, that this Good case luck. was being developed and asked that um, you know who was interested. Then we interview participants, potential participants, and um, and do what's called an intake in the legal world. And actually, probably most of you all are familiar with that too. It's sort of the same kind of process as social services, where you kind of find out background information about the people and and see if it's a good fit. And we ended up with 13 really incredible um, young people from across a variety of islands with very different stories um, about how climate change was impacting uh, their lives, their potential for future and stability and their tradition, a lot of, of traditional heritage. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back in with the settlement piece of the case. So, um, so the settlement. So after months of discovery and preparing to go to trial, including uh, 37, taking 37 depositions, 15 expert and rebuttal reports, um, uh, the 10, you know, the 10 pro bono experts. I talked about these world renowned scientists, including a Nobel laureate, um, all, uh, you know, sat for depositions, um, and the state of Hawaii, um, deposed them, exchanged hundreds of thousands of pages of documents and literally reached a settlement right before the case was going, going to trial. Um, it, it's it's pretty impressive. I definitely would not, have, if you had asked me if this would have happened, I, um, I would have told you no way uh, because I didn't think that there was a world in which Hawaii would agree to the various provisions that we felt like were critical to make a, an agreement meaningful. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about those, but, but the result ended up being tremendous. And it's really a key victory for our youth plaintiffs in, in climate justice everywhere. We, we think it's going to, to be a roadmap um, for other state governments who want to you know, engage around the transportation sector and will also be a tool for um, you know, uh, people who are seeking to engage their government because it provides with them with solutions that they can bring to the table. So how does this happen? So our, our youth plaintiffs, who are really all leaders in their own right, brought all three branches of government together to the same table. And, and it demonstrates that we can, and, and really in order to address this, this crisis, must work together to uphold and protect the rights of young people and, and all future generations in Hawaii. So the settlement agreement wouldn't have been possible without their incredible leadership and all of the various scientists who worked um, very hard to create those reports and take those depositions, as I mentioned, as well as the local work of our part, our local partners like Earth Justice and the deep commitment and support that was shown by um, the Department of Transportation Director Ed Sniffen, uh, Deputy Attorney General um, uh, uh, Sierra uh, Kahahane and Hawaii's Attorney General and Lopez. They were all just very critical to creating this, uh, this settlement agreement. So to dive in a little bit onto the settlement agreement, um, the very first and most important thing is, is the thing that I keep talking about, right, is this recognition that youth have a constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. Um, so it acknowledges that the state's constitutional public trust obligations is to conserve and protect Hawaii's natural beauty and all natural resources, including land, water, air, minerals, and energy sources for the benefit of present and future generations. Sort of let that sink in. It's a really great provision in the settlement agreement. Um, it also acknowledges that the Department of Transportation in establishing and maintaining and operating the state transportation se sector has to preserve, protect, and maintain Hawaii's public trust resources and all uh, Hawaii citizens' rights to a clean and healthful environment. And, and finally, that the state is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the statewide transportation system according to what experts state um, is the best scientific evidence today. Um, showing that correcting Earth's energy imbalance requires reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide to less than 350 parts per million this century. If that's 
kind of um, not super uh, clear, I'll just take a step back and say a couple of things. We passed that 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, I think uh, back in the early 90s. Um, we uh, currently are um, are hovering around 420, 421, et cetera, um, parts per million, which is why we are seeing all of this heating. And when I talk about Earth's energy imbalance, what I really mean is that effect, right, that we used to call global warming um, of, of, of greenhouse gases trapping heat that's coming in from the sun into Earth's systems. Um, so in a, in a balanced system, heat would come in, heat would leave. But because of all the greenhouse gas emissions, heat is coming in. It's like a warm blanket around the earth that's um, raising the earth's temperature to the point where it has a fever, right? Earth is sick. So <clears throat> in the settlement agreement, defendants have agreed to take all actions necessary to achieve zero emissions um, no later than 2045 for ground, ground, ground transportation, sea, and inter-island air transportation. So I just want to emphasize that it's zero emissions. You'll probably hear people talk about net zero out in the world. Um, we, we struggle with the concept of net zero because it, it's really a way for people to continue to pollute while trying to do these other things like carbon capture and sequestration. We're really aiming and and we're really pleased that the settlement agreement was aimed at zero emissions so not just cut finding some other way to let people um, pollute so it requires that they establish a greenhouse gas reduction plan within one year of the agreement um, so that's starting now right so the agreement was uh, made in in june and so a year from then we will be um uh, rolling out this, the state will be rolling out a greenhouse gas reduction plan. And that should lay the foundation. It should be a roadmap for fully decarbonizing Hawaii's transportation system. Um, we know that this isn't going to be overnight, but this is a 20 year process. Um, but we think that a lot is going to happen in the first five years, which is really exciting. That includes reforming the Department of Transportation's budget. So as I, I talked about at the top, the Department of Transportation's budget is massive as a part of Hawaii's overall budget and reforming the budgeting and programming to prioritize decarbonizing of transportation will be essential to succeed. Um, we're also going to, um, the, the settlement agreement demanded, and in fact, HDOT has already started implementing this um, because we've met some of these new leaders, but they created a new leadership unit that will be responsible for ensuring that new policies are implemented and benchmark targets are met in the time required to meet greenhouse gas emissions reductions goals. So there's, it's not just words on a paper, there's actually a team that's being funded to do this work and HDOT has already hired some of these people, which is very, very exciting. But important to our work and really important to our mission as an organization is making sure that young people have a voice in the process. We are leaving them with this earth. And so they need to they need to have a voice in making sure that the earth is left to them in a way that makes sense to them. So um, it was really critical to make sure that young people could um, engage in, and um, we in HDOT will be creating a youth advisory council um, to so that young people are able to provide direct feedback and input into shaping the policies that are gonna be implemented um, for you know the next 20, 21 years and uh, as this settlement agreement is implemented. So um, this is just, I, I, I think it's just really helpful to visualize the impact of this settlement agreement on, on the state. So you can see in black is the historic emissions um, by year in, in the transportation sector. And then the, um, the uh, projections that HDOT was making um, when this case was first filed um, around, there's a big dip, which we know what happened when that dip happened. That was when COVID happened and everybody stopped traveling. Um, and so all of a sudden we saw emissions drop in a significant way, but as people started traveling again, emissions were projected to increase. And in fact, 
in the state of, of Hawaii and around the world, emissions have increased and in some, in many cases, exceeded where they were pre-COVID. Um, and you can see that that HDOT was projecting a very, very small, almost non-existent decline out to 2045. So even though they had these laws and this great constitutional provision, they weren't actually taking the steps necessary to decarbonize and reduce their emissions. This settlement creates a trajectory and a clear pathway for reducing those emissions to zero over the next 20 years. So this is, I think, just this beautiful way to visualize the real tangible impact that this settlement is having, having on the state. And one of the most important provisions, and this is really, if you had you know, said, let's go have a coffee and tell me why you think you'll never, never settle this case, what I would have told you was, without having a clear oversight mechanism, um, whatever the state promises me, I just, I don't know that I can, I can trust, right? Um, so one of the things that I have learned in my life as a litigator, especially around civil rights and constitutional rights, um, is that one of the, the best mechanisms for ensuring that a, a state will abide by their obligations is to have over site by the courts. So the the state of Hawaii, we knew they were ser serious when they agreed to this provision. Um, so they have agreed to essentially being in a relationship with, with us and Earth Justice moderated by the courts um, till 2045. It is a incredible achievement to have something like this. Normally you don't get, these are called, you know, consent decrees out when they're ordered by a court. Um, and they're very hard to achieve. So this was a real indication that the state of, of um, the state was really serious about being in, in, in doing the right thing with the settlement agreement. And you know, as I think is clear from from what I'm saying, this is really an unprecedented um, settlement agreement. There really is no other um, uh, nothing out there like it currently involving all three branches of government um, in terms of, you know, it's, it says nature, scope, and length. It really is a, a testament to both what the state of Hawaii was willing to bring to the table um, and what our legal teams and the young leaders who were um, we were representing in this case were able to achieve. We really hope that this is going to be a model for, for states and countries around the world to address the transportation sector. Um, in many, many instances, the transportation sector, if it's not the leading um, polluter, it's in second or third place. So it is one of the most critical sectors for us to get under control. And I think, you know, I, I can let you read this slide because it's, I think, beautiful what Riley Brooks says. Um, but what what I will say about it is that I think we're really witnessing true democracy in action. And it's really, in my experience, for the first time on climate change. We have all three branches of government coming together in Hawaii for um, for meaningful change. And, and they've committed to doing this together and they have agreed to processes for dispute resolution, um, to make sure that young people have a voice at the table, and to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect young people's constitutional right to a livable future. And, you know, the last thing that I will say is we have um, just these incredible young people that we work with. These are all that you see right now that are, these are young, the young, several of the young plaintiffs in Hawaii um, Kalalapa is not featured on this photo, but she said this at a presentation that I gave with her and it is just, is just really resonated with me and has stuck with me forever. Um, which is that, that these young people are using their voice sometimes in a way that feels like the first time that they've been really empowered by an adult with power to make change, um, to speak and to speak truth to power, right? To, to speak to a court is to speak truth to power. And um, and it is, uh, it is incredible the impact that these young people are having and giving
gives me hope that um, for a, a, a better world in a time where I think sometimes we just need some good news. So this is really good news and good news that I hope that we can figure out how to work in partnership together to um, to create some awesome curriculum. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Debbie and Krista to talk a little bit more about this. Um, and yeah, and then I'm happy to answer any questions that come up for folks. Thank you, Matt. Great. Yeah, we have some time for questions. Um, and then we'll dive a bit into this project that we want to work on. Those of you who have joined that are willing to work with us. Um, there's a question in the chat. Can you read it, Matt? Do you need me to read it out? Yeah, let me just pull over all my... Or Dave, feel free to unmute if you want to ask too. Okay. Uh, sure. sure, I'm happy to. Um, what roles do you see for student activists to support and extend the gains made in the Navajina case? Yeah, so I think that's a really critical part of this, right? So we we have several tools in our toolbox of the settlement agreement, including the direct pathway to the governor, um, HDOT. And I think that um, one of the things that we're going to really need to do is to carefully work around the legislative sessions to make sure that um, funding is being delivered to HDOT as is promised and required by the settlement agreement. But I do think that there is going to be an incredibly important role for student activists to play to just turn out in, um, in public. Um, and to, to, for example, I, am, I can foresee things like lobby days happening where um, we uh, go and talk to legislators about the importance of securing um, the right funding for these various programs. Because even though the court and HDOT and the governor has agreed to you know, do this, we still need the legislature to act and to ensure that funding is provided to make sure that these programs can happen. And so that's gonna be a big, big piece of public participation. Of course, there's also youth participating on the um, the advisory council, which uh, you know I'm not exactly sure how that is going to be rolled out. I know that HDOT has started engaging um, with some consultants about the development of the advisory council, but I imagine that there will be terms and folks will you know cut, join and then roll off, et cetera. And so I think there will be an ongoing. Um, opportunity for the next 20 years to be really, really involved if you want to be involved on on that side, right? So like with the policymakers as opposed to, um, you know, in the sort of more legislative arena. Those are the two that really come to mind. Yeah, really important. Hold the government accountable and get in there and support legislation. Excellent. Thanks. There is a question from Keala um, about the scope of the sea transportation covered by the settlement. Are you able to answer that, Matt? Do you know? Um, well, if I could elaborate on that, I'm just kind of wondering specifically, um, you know, with the air transportation, it, it, I guess it's specifically inner island. Is that the same thing for sea transportation? Um, you know, just given the the cargo ships that come in, some of them if they're foreign flagged. Uh, and then, of course, you've got all the military vessels that if they're not nuclear powered, like how wide does that scope go for for the ocean transportation? Yeah, that's a really good question. And you've you've honed in on one of the areas where the settlement, you know, just doesn't quite reach. Right. The um, things that are controlled by the federal government or um, international agreements aren't controlled by this settlement agreement. So, which isn't to say, let's be clear, the state of Hawaii has a lot of um, control over uh, how they uh, develop infrastructure that would enable, um, for example, liquefied natural gas to come to the islands, right? Like the, 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 the state would have to develop that infrastructure in order for those shipments to become possible. So by stopping that development, those ships, there's no, there's no port for them to land at. Um, 
there so there are ways in which the state can influence um, non inter island travel. Um, but a lot of that is regulated by by federal and international agreement, which is not covered by the settlement agreement. Leon, do you want to ask your question? Hmm. Sure. Yeah, I, I put it in the chat, but I was just wondering in terms of the, the time frame. Um, with these checkpoints, are they happening yearly or every five years? And sort of a follow-up is, can you kind of give a concrete example of what the courts would actually, how they would enforce these emission targets if, if the state isn't meeting them? Sure, so the, um, so great question. The initial uh, answer is a little complicated, which is the checkpoints start off as annual checkpoints with annual reporting and then, um, transition to some five-year checkpoints, that there are actual annual requirements for the entire existence of the agreements around some reporting. Um, the the um, I, the devil's kind of in the details, right? Like I can't remember exactly which metrics are required annually off the top of my head, but it is right there in the settlement agreement, which we will share with everyone and you can take a look at it. Um, so it's, it is actually in black and white in the settlement agreement. Um, the the court enforcement is really interesting. So they agreed to a process, right? They so the court retains jurisdiction. They agreed to essentially a process for um, trying to resolve disputes. And then if we can't resolve disputes, we just get to ask the court to intervene. So why this is important and and why it parallels that other process that I talked about, which is called a consent decree, is that. In a normal settlement agreement, right, a normal contract, you would have to take the party to court to enforce the contract anew. So you'd have to file a brand new lawsuit, so, so time and resource intensive. This short circuits that. So we, if we um, meet with the state and can't come to a resolution, we have throughout the entirety of the life of the settlement agreement, we have the ability to go directly to back to the environmental court and just say, reopen the case. So we don't have to file a new case, nothing. So it is a really, it's an incredibly powerful provision, um, which I can't quite overstate enough. Thank you. Great. So I think let's take a minute now and shift a bit. Krista, do you mind, maybe we can prompt those on the call to, um, our question about how can we, and if we could put that slide back to our goal, our vision for Hawaii is that every young person knows about this case and about their right to a life-sustaining climate. Right. Um, I've, I've been involved with a lot of professional development for faculty around how to um, embed climate change information into courses at all levels and all topics. It doesn't matter if you aren't a lawyer or you don't teach law or political science. Um, and, and one of the hardest things to keep up with, you know, because teachers are so busy is like, what is going on and what does this mean? And to me, the piece that is so exciting is this right here, you know, so aside from the case and the details and all of that, what does this mean? And how can I work with this idea, you know, as a teacher, I teach writing and um, research, how can I convey to our students that uh, the state, even if this is in the state's constitution, like this has recently been affirmed as part of this case. And there's research around um, climate anxiety and mental health of our students and young people, which is directly tied to their, um, you know, sense that action is being taken. So we need to always be looking for good news and this type of climate action win um, on behalf of young people. So I'm really curious how it is, uh, how this kind of sparks other teachers, no matter what you teach. You know, if, you, if you're if you an art teacher, how could you draw pictures about the case? If you're an English teacher, what would you have your students research? 
And then especially, you know, coming into this election year, we're, we're always telling young people, oh, you can get involved, um, but it's so often disappointing. And this is just such an exciting um, win for how sometimes climate action works. And I really want to thank Matt and Emily and the lawyers at Our Children's Trust. I hear you say hundreds of thousands of pages and documents. I can't even imagine um, the work and the detail of it. And I want to thank you for that. And so like, how can we as teachers take what you've done and work with it and translate it and share this um, with our students in every grade and every subject across Hawaii in private schools, in public schools, K-12, community college, University of Hawaii. Uh, I'd really like to see all of us carrying a little piece of this landmark case. Thanks, Krista. And we have some young people on the, the call tonight, some students. And so if you have ideas as well, we want to hear from you. Will you go back and share it with your teachers and encourage them to bring it into the classroom and share with your peers? So shall we talk about September 9th, next steps? Yeah. So as Krista was saying, we, you know, we want to get this out. We want to invite you back into the space in person so we can have some deeper conversations um, our Children's Trust lawyers are spread throughout the country, but they are going to be here in Hawaii. And thank you so much for being willing to come on September 9th. I realize it's a Monday night, great way to start the week. Um, they happen to be here for that for that weekend and the following week. So we're really lucky to get them to join us at that educators night. It will be here at Punahou School. Um, and Krista just entered or just added the link in the chat for you if you'd like to sign up and join us. For educators, we are asking for you to complete lessons that you then implement in your class or your course. Um, and thanks to Dave Ball and Pam Sakamoto, who are here on the call with the Davis Democracy Initiative app. You know, they'll be offering a small stipend or award for those teachers that, that do that work with us. So join us on September 9th. We'll have dinner for you. Um, and as Krista said, this is the uplifting work that we get to do. And I think it's exciting. Um, and Krista, do you have anything else you want to add to this part? Just that um, the best opportunities for teachers are when teachers get to talk with teachers. And you can see that um, the Our Children's Trust team you know, has all these materials. We'll have a video of today's talk. They have all these slides. Uh, they will be, you know, talk with you about anything that would help you design a lesson plan around our Hawaii youth having the right to a clean and healthful environment. Uh, so I think it's a great opportunity to get to talk with them and get to talk with fellow teachers because educators are the most creative people, right? So just, you know, what does it spark for you and come and talk with other teachers and, and ask Emily and Matt, you know, what do you need in order to be able to talk to youth about climate policy, about rights? and about the future and what this means for Hawaii, uh, as well as that ripple effect that was mentioned. Yeah, Mahalo everyone for joining. Have a great night. Let us know if you have any questions. Bye.